In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord give you his peace. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Thomas of Cori. I'll read to you the brief biography of the saint in the, the Franciscan Book of Saints. St. Thomas was born at Cori near Valletri in the Roman Campania in the year 1655 and in baptism received the name of Francis Anthony. His parents were poor shepherds but very pious Christians who by their virtuous teachings and good example reared their children in the fear of God. It seemed that little Francis Anthony had in a very special manner inherited the gift of piety from them. His innocent demeanor and fervent devotion so distinguished him among his companions that he was quite generally called the Little Saint. He pursued his higher studies with great diligence and success in a school conducted by a devout canon of his native town. However, the poverty of his parents soon compelled him to discontinue his studies and to return to his father's flocks. But even in the quiet pastures, amid the cliffs and the woods, he never desisted from prayer and study. When both of his parents had died, Thomas sold the flocks which he had inherited from them, presented the proceeds to his two sisters for their dowry, and then asked to be admitted to the friary of the Friars Minor at Cory. He was received in February 1677 and was sent to the novitiate at Orvieto, where he was invested under the name of Friar Thomas. With redoubled fervor, he progressed from virtue to virtue. At Viterbo and Velletri, he studied philosophy and theology with marked success, and finally, when he was 28 years old, he celebrated his first Holy Mass amid tears of devotion and joy in the friary at Velletri. After he had spent some time at Orvieto, filling the office of novice master with much zeal and success, he begged his superiors to allow him to retire to the exceptionally strict friary of Civitella near Subiaco, situated in a wild mountainous solitude, in order to sacrifice his life to God in strict penance, ceaseless prayer, and work. Later on, when he was appointed superior of this house, he instilled into his brethren such love for religious discipline that Civitella soon became the model friary of the province. He developed his companions into a band of zealous and courageous men who traveled as missionaries to India and to China. One of them received the crown of martyrdom. His ardent wish to go with them was never fulfilled. Instead, the provincial superiors assigned him the Roman Campania and the desert mountain region of Subiaco as his permanent field of labor. Here, Thomas labored with the fiery zeal of a St. Paul for the space of 20 years, so that he was generally called the Apostle of Subiaco. When there was question of gaining souls, no journey was too distant or wearisome. Snow and rain, heat and cold, fatigue and vigils, hunger, thirst, and the painful wounds which the sharp stones made in his bare feet were borne by him with holy joy. As a reward for all this hardship, he saw great bands of sinners approach in order to be reconciled with God through him, who was at the same time gifted in reading hearts. He was often compelled to spend whole days and even nights without interruption in the holy tribunal of penance. Here it was also that, as a 74-year-old man, Thomas was attacked by a severe hemorrhage, which brought him to his deathbed. With heavenly patience and amid continuous prayer, he continued to suffer severe pain for several days, until with the crucifix in one hand and an image of the Blessed Virgin in the other, he went to his eternal reward while pronouncing the holy names of Jesus and Mary. It was on the day and at the hour he had himself foretold, January 11, 1729. His body reposes before the high altar in the friary church of Civitella. Pope Pius VI beatified him on August 18, 1786, and I think it was Pope John Paul II who solemnly canonized him. Just a couple of little reflections. Um, I've had the, the joy of visiting the friary uh, where he lived and where he's entombed twice. Um, I used to be stationed in a friary that was not too far from, from, uh, from Civitella. Um, uh, the town is also known as Belegra. And um, it's, it's a fascinating little friary. Uh, in fact, it, it has a, an interesting nickname. The Italians call it uh, Il Nido dei Santi, the Nest of Saints. And the reason why is that um, uh, St. Thomas of Cori is, is not at all the only saint that's passed through there. Actually, it's, it's a kind of hothouse of, of sanctity where uh, numerous saints, blessed venerables, and servants of God have lived down through the centuries, um, including some in the, in the 20th century. And... Uh, 
Um, and so it was really the, the, the heart, the center of a, of a renewal of the Franciscan order um, in St. Thomas's time and, and thereafter. Um, and one of the, the things I don't really mention in the biography here is that that friary is, uh, is principally uh, a, a Franciscan retreat. That is, it's, it's princi principally a contemplative house. Right? They, they mentioned here the, the tireless apostolic labors of St. Thomas of Cori, but, but really most of the friars in that house uh, dedicated themselves uh, almost exclusively to, to prayer and to contemplation in the hiddenness of that, that uh, isolated mountain region. Um, and that really uh, may be the, a big part of the secret of, the, uh, uh, of all of the, the flames of holiness that have poured forth from that house, right? It was a house of prayer. Because, um, of course, the, the renewal of the church, you know, it, it always demands that there be apostles who, who go about traveling from place to place and, and preaching. But um, ultimately, the renewal of the church always depends upon the contemplatives, um, it's uh, uh, Pope John Paul II referred to uh, contemplative communities as the lungs of the church. Um, you know, without without lungs, of course, the the body soon dies, and if the lungs aren't working well, the body becomes very weak, right? Because you're you're out of breath. Um, well, so too in the in the apostolic life of the church, you know, uh, contemplative communities give strength, uh, give vigor. They they breathe the air of holiness and the and the and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, into the rest of the mystical body of Christ. And when the lungs aren't functioning properly, then the whole body suffers. Uh, and so for this reason, the, the church has never ceased to, uh, to foster and to, and to protect the, the contemplative life. Um, and if you, if you look at the, you know, the story of these past few decades where so much confusion and, and, and even scandal has reigned in, in different quarters of the church, um, you'll find that the places that um, really have been the, the source of... Uh, um, of, of authentic health and, and, and holiness within the church, or specifically the, the contemplative communities, which have uh, have maintained uh, their fidelity to their charism and to their mission. Right here in America, for instance, there are a number of Carmelite monasteries, cloistered Carmelite monasteries, which have have remained um, very faithful down through the decades, and they continue to have uh, not only to have vocations, but even to be bustling with vocations. Right? One example, the, the Carmelites in Valparaiso, New Mexico, um, uh, or the, the Carmelites in Buffalo, New York. They're so buff bustling with vocations that they're, they're continuing to found new monasteries because they don't have room anymore in the old monasteries. Um, and so in order to free up space, they, they have new foundations. Uh, you know, that, that's the way it really should be always in the life of the church, right? Um, and, and what's the secret is that they, they maintained the, you know, the spirit of prayer and contemplation. You know? Whereas you, you, you look at what's happened in, in many other communities uh, in this period, you know, uh, uh, you'll find that you know, in, the, in the confusion that reigned back in the 60s and 70s, very often the first thing to go was the contemplative life. You know, they would, uh, you know, communities that used to have five, six, seven hours of community prayer would start cutting away, cutting away, cutting it away. Um, you know, they would make the meditation time optional. They would say, well, instead of doing the meditation in your chapel, in the chapel, you can, uh, together as a community, you know, if you want to, you can do it in your, in your cell alone. Um, and of course, you know, the, it's always easy to find an excuse to, to skip or to, to cut short your meditation. Um, you know, or they would t take out the, the daily rosary and they'd replace it with something else that, some other novelty that seemed more interesting at the time. Or, um, in, in, in some cases, tragically, they, they would even replace the daily holy hour with a daily happy hour, you know, and, and instead of going to adore our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, they would all sit around laughing and, and drinking a beer. Or, um, and it didn't occur to them that what they were doing was committing uh, spiritual suicide, right? Uh, a study came out recently which said that in this, in this period, these past 40 years, you know, a hundred different, over a hundred religious congregations uh, have folded in the church, you know, just in these past 40 years, over a hundred religious congregations. Now, obviously, in the history of the church, there's always a, you know, a congregation here or there that folds. That, that, uh, but, but that's, in, to my knowledge, an unprecedented number. You know, and, and if you look at the, the congregations that are left, there, you know, there are numerous other ones where the average age is, let's say, in the 70s, you know, 75 or 80 years old. You know, and what's going to happen with them 10, 15 years from now? Um, you know, in many cases, they're closing down houses left and right. 
you know, selling them so that they become country clubs and this way they can get a few million dollars to, to build a house of, re of repose, you know, some kind of a, you know, a, 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 some kind of a nursing home for the elderly religious and they think this is a wonderful thing. You know, well, it's not a wonderful thing. <laughs> you know, if, um, if you're doing your job, if you're faithful to your charism and in particular if you're, if you're fervent in prayer, God will send the vocations so that you don't have to shut down uh, and, and open up uh, nursing homes for your members. You'll have younger friars and sisters to take care of you, um, and to you know, and and, uh, uh, and and the older ones may even maintain their vigor, so that they they're, you know they're still plugging away when they're in their older years. Um, and so, um, you know, in this day and age, we need to we need to to look to the example of Saint Thomas of Cori and of the contemplative friars that that were with him um, at Pellegra that they would uh, give us the grace to, to really to treasure uh, the gift of regular observance, the gift of, of, uh, of prayer in our friaries and, and, and convents and monasteries um, so that we don't go the way of, the, of those other hundred or more communities. Um, there's an interesting book which, which puts it very well, uh, a classic called uh, The Soul of the Apostolate. By a, it's by a French Benedictine named Dom Chotard. Uh, and the basic thesis of you know of Dom Shutar's book is you know is that uh, you know, if we look at our apostolate as being sort of like you know like a physical body, well the, the body, in order to remain alive and vigorous, it has to have what um, you know it's not enough just to give it food and, and drink and air you know it's got to have a soul. Right? The soul is what gives life to the body. When the soul and the body separate, the uh, that's called death, and the body starts to to break down, and after a while it starts to stink, right? Um, well, when you give yourself over so wholly to the spirit of activism, you know that um, that you neglect prayer, which is the soul of the apostolate. What eventually happens is your apostolate becomes dead, you know, and, and, and it starts to stink. Um, and God forbid that that should ever happen in our communities. So, uh, so let's pray to Saint Thomas of Cori that he would give us that, the grace to treasure the contemplative life, so that our our apostolate might be a real apostolate, uh, invigorated, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, filled with holiness uh, and, and uh, uh, for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.